Shalom and welcome to Wisdom in Torah, guys. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, it's always nice to be here and always nice to share what I'm learning with you all in, the, in regards to the Torah, the commandments, and the statutes of the Lord. Uh, we are going to be talking about a very interesting um, uh, topic that I think it is important for us to understand. Give me one second, guys. It's important for us to understand. Okay. It is a concept of what is the reason for the blood in the Bible? Why do we need blood in Scripture? Why is the blood so significant, you know, in every language, in the language that we use as believers in Yeshua? You know, why is the blood so important when, it's, when in fact, the word sprinkling or sprinkled by the blood is found only in the book of Hebrews and once in the book of uh, uh, 1 Peter? And I've done this teaching in Spanish, and I did it uh, in San Antonio just translating from Spanish to English, but I want to do it in English, only in English, uh, and I want to be able to cover certain things. I do not know how much I'll be able to cover. It's, a, it's actually a, it's an intro, okay? I mean, uh, I would love for you guys to see all the res uh, resources that I use to do this, and I could only cover only certain parts of it. There's a lot here that I think we should learn. Many times, let me ask you this question. How many of you have always said, I've been redeemed by the blood of Messiah. Okay. Put, put it on the chat here real quick. How many of you have actually used those words, but yet you never really understood the relevance of blood in the Bible? And I'm going to talk about a few things in regards to what blood is for. And I'm going to ask a few questions that you may think may be controversial, but they're not really. Uh, it's just that, again, come back to the whole bottom line. If we do not study the temple which the whole sprinkling of the blood is all temple related. Sacrifices, all temple related. Offerings, all temple related. So what do you do when you go to an Orthodox and you say, well, Jesus died for all my sins. And then all of a sudden he says, but there was atonement for sin in the Bible. And he can take you to chapter 3, 4, 5, and 6 of the book of Leviticus and prove to you that there was already atonement for for sins and there was forgiveness even the day of atonement is a day of atonement you know yom hakipuim you know it's actually a day of forgiveness a pardon from god for all the abominations of the people of israel so in the bible and this is something people don't want to talk about i really i really need you to give me the time to exp uh, to state my case many people when they hear this stuff immediately start arguing and it's like please guys just just hear first you know, because I'm a believer in Yeshua, and I wholeheartedly support, you know, the language the Bible talks about this whole thing. But some of us really do not understand why it uses that language. And we need to understand the legality behind it. And sometimes we spend so much time arguing about stuff we don't study that we lose really the blessing of trying to understand it. Okay, so the whole idea is trying to bring something to you that I think is extremely it's imperative that we know. I just finished my teaching on the book of Hebrews. And this is where, where I really caught on to it. I understood it already, but I really had to emphasize the importance of it. Because when I read in the book of Hebrews, then I understood the context of the book of Hebrews and to what it's really referencing to. It's not talking about a new priesthood. It's not talking about, for, I mean, a new priesthood for you and me. It's not talking about, um, it's not talking about um, doing away with the law. It's not talking about... Um, eliminating the temple, but we don't really focus on these areas. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask you a few questions, and I'm not going to answer them in this in this order, but I will answer them as I go along, okay? But I need you to really allow me the time and the space to ask the questions and answer them, okay? It says, what is the reason for the blood? What is the reason for the need of blood in the Bible? Why is that important? I mean, obviously, you know, offerings have been accepted by God, since Cain and Abel, because it was Cain's idea to bring an offering to God, a mincha, okay? And Cain brought it of the flock, so there was blood being shed. It was the attitude of Cain that God did not like. Obviously, he had a bad attitude. He murdered his brother. We have offerings being brought by Noah after the flood. We have offerings being uh, brought forward by Abraham when he came into the land, by uh, by by Jacob, by everyone in the Bible. They brought donations they brought an offering to God. And 
it was ratified with blood. Covenants in the ancient world, please go back and look at the, uh, the book by uh, Clay Trumbull, uh, Clay, uh, Blood Covenant. It's a really, really good book. It was written about 130 years ago, and it's very relevant to this day because of rituals of blood that we're not aware of today. The Bible is all about the ratification of blood. It's what, what, that, what is the purpose of the blood? Many people, they study the temple, and they oh, when they attempt to study the temple, or they think about the temple, they think death. And they talk about the animals, about death. And, and, and anyone who really studies the Beit HaMikdash, the temple knows that the temple is all about life. And it's all about, you know, how the Lord wants to restore the relationship between you and him. That was a, a, there was a, a separation due to our conduct and our misbehavior to his commandments. So while many people look at the offering system as the death of an animal, the Bible itself consider it as life because the life is in the blood. Therefore, uh, the the meat of that animal becomes the food source for the priests and the Levites and their families. But we don't really organize it that way because we are foreign to that type of understanding. And I want to repeat that over and over and over. It is hard pressed for people to understand about what the meaning of blood is if we don't really look at it from a temple perspective. Okay, and uh, and this is very important. Second question. Who can manipulate the blood in the according to scripture? Can Yeshua manipulate the blood on the earth? Is he legally allowed to manipulate the blood, meaning that he can sprinkle any kind of blood in any altar in the temple in the millennial reign? No, can't do it. Only the sons of Aaron can, according to the Bible. What is the purpose of the blood? That's the core essence of our teaching. What is the core? Uh, what is the purpose for the blood? And then, in this case, from the blood of Yeshua. Okay, uh, when we use it that way. And how come none of those things happen in the temple? And um, and uh, Yeshua's offering, as a type of the offering, happen outside of the camp. And this is something that I've been asking myself for the last 10 years and reading the book of Hebrews and going over the information on the book of Hebrews from a from a cultural backgrounds and also from temple perspective. I think I was able to cut on to it this more than ever this year. And I was able to understand it more to the point that my faith in, in Yeshua as the only possible Messiah for Israel is 100 percent stronger today than it was yesterday. And yesterday it was ninety nine point nine because I understand now his role his purpose, his function, his role, his purpose, and his function. So what we're going to do, I'm going to try to share with you what I'm learning about what is the purpose of the blood? What is the reason for the blood in the Bible? And what really picked my interest is the letter to the Hebrews began to use what happened on Mount Sinai as a backdrop to the work of Yeshua in chapter 9 and 10 of the book of Hebrews. Chapter 9 and 10 of the book of Hebrews is trying, the writer is trying to outline for you how Yeshua fulfills something that outside the temple sphere that the temple itself cannot provide. And this is extremely important. Acts chapter 13, verse 36 to 39. You need to do those readings on your own. And also Galatians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 it is clearly outline, uh, outlining for you, letting you know that the Torah could not do one thing for anyone. The Torah could not do any anyone one thing. Cannot do anything. It cannot do this for you. It cannot give you per, uh, eternal life. Only God can give you the pardon in order for you to be able to enter into eternal life because we are a kingdom. We are a kingdom in the dispersion who suffers the virus of death. That's really the problem, okay? The Torah can give you instruction, can allow you to enter into the sphere of life, but only the gift of the great king can give you the access to eternal, to the eternal, to life eternal. In this case, eternal life. So therefore, uh, in the book of uh, in the book of Galatians chapter three, the letter to the Galatians chapter three, verse twenty and twenty one tells you, you know that if there was one law that can provide life, the Torah itself gives you the instructions to keep you in a sacred sacred space to be holy unto God. So what really picked my interest was when I noticed that um, there's only three times in the Bible. When blood had touched a human being, this is extremely important. I'm going to take it from this perspective. Blood in scripture 
how it is applied in the temple for the holy things of God is very different than the way that it was done in uh, in the ancient pagan world. Okay, but if we never look into ancient Near Eastern perspective, rituals, sacrifices, temples, and also the way they function as a society, we're not going to catch it. So let me share the screen here, and I'm going to go right to the information. And I, I, I think it is imperative, and it is, to me, extremely important that we get this. All right? When I was reading in... Uh, when I was reading in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 10, chapter 9 and 10, okay, it was given reference to this verse right here, right here in uh, Exodus 24, verse 1 through 18. In verse 8 of chapter 24, the Bible says, and he sprinkled on the people. Now, let, let, let's go there real quick. I want to read Exodus 24. Exodus 24, verse 1 through 8. And remember that this is a Yom HaKippurim. This is the Day of Atonement. Moses went up to the mountain. The people, uh, Moses interceded on behalf of the people. The people worshipped the golden calf. They deserved to, be, to, 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 to die. But the Lord gave a pardon. He gave a remission. It was God's grace that gave that remission to the people. But what really intrigued me was the way Moses, when he came down to the mountain, what did he do to ratify the covenant? Remember, Moses threw the tablets down when they saw the gold, when he saw the golden calf being worshipped. Therefore, the covenant was broken by default. All of Israel had transgressed the law. Therefore, the penalty of death. Can, should have come upon all of them because they came into a covenantal agreement as a nation that they would not worship any image of anything. The, yeah, the guilt of those 3,000 per, can permeate through the whole nation. Okay? This is something that uh, 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 individual shame and collective shame. We don't understand those contexts today because we don't live in those cultures. For the shame of those 3,000, and, and I can prove this to you. This is the reason why God was so gracious and God was so merciful that he allowed for divine judgment to occur, to separate the innocent from the guilty. That's an act of mercy. By giving them the bitter waters, by giving them uh, the bitter waters to drink. And Moses, he took the dust from the golden calf that he grinded down. He threw it over the water that was coming down from the, from the brook on the mountain. And he made all of Israel drink it. Therefore, that's divine judgment. That's the, the, the ordeal is called in the ancient Near East. And then only 3,000 of them were the guilty party, and they received the penalty of death, right? The Levites took care of that. But the other people, although they witnessed, they saw it, they didn't do anything in regards to it, but they needed to go through the process of a judicial matter in order for them to be actually justified. And then God forgave them as a nation. Because he wanted to take issue with them. And this is the ratification ritual here. When Moses comes down from the mountain, this is what Moses does to ratify the covenant that God is now allowing them to renew when he wrote the new tablets. Okay? It has to be ratified with blood. That makes sense. That's why in Hebrews chapter 9, I'm going to go here real quick. I'm going to move around, moving forward a little bit. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 22, it says, 922, it says, Indeed, nearly everything is purified, pay attention to the words, purified with blood. The question is purification. That's the one thing that hardly anyone talks about when we read these verses. Purify with blood according to the law. And apart from the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And, that, and I've talked about this in length. The word there, forgiveness, is the Greek word aphesis. And the word aphesis means basically a cure or a remission. I'm sorry, a remission of a sickness. There's no cure for like death, for example. Okay, that's the context of the Bible. So the word aphesis in the Greek, look that up. It's quite interesting. It was an ancient medical term back in the time of the first century and before that. 
Okay. So therefore, he is telling you nearly everything is purified, purified. So let's look at that word in the Greek and see what tells us. The word in the Greek here, it means to purify, to whore. Very important from the Hebrew, to make cleanse, purge, to cleanse. But this is really interesting because it's using the, the word that to the Hebrew that is applied as to whore, something that's ritually cleansed. We have been made through Yeshua ritually clean by not, now receiving eternal life. Resurrection becomes now the proof that we will have eternal life. And if we have eternal life, it means that we have been purified, okay, by the blood, with blood. So the question is, why is the blood so important? That's the question. That through through this particular ritual, we can come near the Lord and then go back to Mount Sinai as a legal precedent to establish this. And Moses said, go up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, 70, uh, 70 from the elders of Israel. You will worship at a distance, and Moses alone will come near the Lord, and they will not uh, uh, they will not come near, and the people will not go up with them. So we understand what happened here, right? So we know that in verse 4, uh, in ver verse 3, and Moses came. Let me reverse this, continue here, okay? And it says, and Moses alone will come near to the Lord, and they will not come near, and the people will not go up with him. And Moses came, and he told the people all the words of the Lord, and all the congregation, and all the regulations. And all the people answered with one voice and said, the words of the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote all the words of the Lord, and he rose up early in the morning, and he built an altar at the base of the mountain, and set up 12 memorial stones. To the 12 tribes of Israel, he sent young men from Israel, and they offer burnt offering, and they sacrifice they sacrifice sacrifices and fellow, fellowship offerings to the Lord using bulls. And Moses took half of the blood and put it on, the, on its bowls, and half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar, right? And then he says, and he took the scroll of the covenant, read it in a hearing of the people, and they said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will listen. And Moses took blood and sprinkled it on the people. And he said, look, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance to all these words. Yeshua almost, almost quoted this verbatim. This is the blood of the covenant for remission of sin. When he was having that last meal, that last Passover. He almost verbatim said that. This is the blood of the covenant. And it says, for forgiveness of sin. Look at that word in the Greek. And you see, it says, aphesis, remission. So the question is, how can this blood bring remission? And the remission is not the regular forgiveness. Because there was already a mechanism in place on the earth that will give you forgiveness. That would allow you to come near God if you transgress. And we will cover that in a minute. Okay, so there was. Forgiveness in the Bible for unwillful, involuntary, and even on Yom Kippur, if the nation has sinned as a nation, the Lord can render them uh, a cleanse and pure, okay, give a pardon once a year by the intercession of one man, the high priest. And the Lord will forgive them because the Lord he accepted the uh, the the uh, the work of the intermediary, the high priest, as a vehicle of a connecting between heaven and earth, connecting God between uh, uh, connecting the Lord back to His people. That's the purpose of the high priest. That's why the Book of Hebrews is presenting Yeshua as a high priest because He came to restore humanity back to the Garden to God's sacred space. Thus, He becomes a mediator, and the Bible tells you that He was a mediator between God and man, Yeshua. I mean, it's very clear when we understand it, okay? So why did Moses sprinkle the blood on the people? Now, I mentioned earlier, there's only three times in Scripture where blood had actually touched a human being, okay? One, in this particular event right here. Two, when the sons of Aaron were uh, actually dedicated as high priests, Moses and Aaron. They, they put blood on the uh, on the uh, ear, right ear, right thumb, and right big toe. Okay? You find that in Leviticus chapter 8. Let's go read it. I like to read this stuff because it's important, okay? You should know this, but let's read it. Let's read it so you know where I'm, so you know where I'm at. So let's go to Leviticus chapter 8, verse 22 and 24. 
I think you should eat that. You should read the whole thing, but you know, it's important to understand how they were dedicated. They were anointed. They were ordained. Okay. And, the, and once I understand, once we explain the reason for the blood, then this will be a shadow of a doubt without a shadow of a doubt. I could confidently say that there's no such a thing as a Melchizedek priesthood for anybody here on the earth. And I know that's a big statement. But once you understand the role of the blood, then you will understand that's why God cannot allow any other priesthood to intercede on behalf of humanity on the earth. That's why Yeshua could only do it on the heavenly tabernacle, not on the earth. Yeshua, for 40 days after he resurrected, never talked against the temple, never spoke against the priesthood, never mentioned Melchizedek, never mentioned none of that, none of that stuff for 40 years after Yeshua died and resurrected. Neither Paul, nor James, nor Peter, nor John, and any of the disciples ever talked about a new priesthood or doing away with the offerings on the temple or the Melchizedek priesthood. No one ever talked about that in regards to the people. Only the writer of Hebrews in regards to Yeshua. That's quite simple. And to be honest with you, I don't know why people don't get it. I, to be honest with you, I'm not being arrogant. I'm just trying to, I mean, it's no evidence anywhere. That there's such a thing as a Melchizedek priesthood. But let me go back to the point. How can I be so confident? Because the sons of Aaron were anointed with, or with, uh, with oil and touched blood. And I'm going to explain this in a minute. Let's read from verse 18. Then he brought them the ram of burnt offering near Aaron and his sons, placing their hands on the, head, on the ram's head. And he slaughtered it. Then Moses sprinkled the blood on the altar all around. Then he cut the ram into pieces. Moses turned into smoke the head of the pieces and the suet, and he washed the inner parts on the lower leg bones in the water. Moses turned, uh, turned into smoke all of the ram on the altar, and it was a burnt offering as an appeasing of fragrance, an offering made by fire to the Lord, just as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then he brought the second ram near and the second and the ram of consecration. And Aaron and his sons placed their hands on the ram, uh, ram's head, and he slaughtered it. Then Moses took some of its blood and put it on Aaron's right ear and on his right hand, uh, right hand's thumb and on his right foot's big toe. Then he brought Aaron's sons near. Notice the Levites were not anointed. They were not separated in this fashion. They were set aside to help the sons of Aaron. But the sons of Aaron are the only people on this earth that in the Bible, they put the oil of anointment, setting them aside for a high honor position royalty within Israel, in this case, the priesthood, and then blood, sanctify them, purify them, set them aside, made them holy. So therefore, now they could only do the work in regards to the temple service. And by the way, this is the reason why in the book of Ezekiel, they returned to their service, because God ordained them, anointed them, and also sanctify them for that sole purpose. So it says, and he slaughtered it. Then he took, Moses took some of its blood and put it on Aaron's right ear lobe and on his right hand's thumb and on his right foot, big toe. Then he brought his sons near and Moses uh, put some of the blood on their right ear lobe and on the right hand's thumb and on the right hand's foot, uh, big toe. Moses sprinkled the blood all around the altar. He did with Israel what he did with Moses in the case of uh, the blood. Remember, he took the blood, sprinkled the people, sprinkled the altar. That was to create what is called indexing, meaning this it's not to compare the same office as Aaron. Okay. Although this, this, uh, the service is similar in the sense that he sprinkled the people on the altar, he sprinkled on Moses, you know, the blood on the ear, the big, uh, the, the, the big toe of uh, uh, the right thumb on the big toe. That doesn't mean that now Israel is going to do the same thing as, you know, as the sons of Aaron to manipulate the blood in the temple. Two different offices together. Please understand that. But what's interesting here is the scholars call this indexing. Indexing means when, uh, for example, I'm going to read it here. This is my um, indexing. It's a uh, covenant indexing. It's a bilateral covenant between God and Israel. In the case of Mount Sinai, chapter 24 of the book of Exodus, right? But the same thing happens in Leviticus chapter 8. When the Lord set, set them aside, 
weighed them, ordained them, sanctified them, and purified them for that service, for that office of the high priesthood. Only they can do the work of that environment of the high priest on the temple. That's why there are rules about what they could do, when they could not do. They could do certain things that, that no one else could do because they were called for that job. Okay? So it's a bilateral, co bilateral covenant. In other words, excuse me, the sons of Aaron will receive the tithe from the Levites. Okay? And they receive certain tithe too in exchange for the service in the temple. So it's bilateral in that sense. But the office of the high priesthood was a gift that God gave to them. Numbers chapter 18 says that. It was a gift given to them. A gift of the priesthood to them with a greater responsibility. Okay? So it says, if Israel sins, this is important. This is about Exodus 24. If Israel sins, it will defile God's sacred space, which is the temple. Blood represents life thus. By the blood of Messiah, we are restored to God's sacred space, the garden, where death is not present. So that means that when uh, uh, when there is um, when the blood, when we talk about the blood of Yeshua being sprinkled on the heavenly tabernacle, because Yeshua, according to the Torah, and we need to really learn this, Yeshua, according to the Torah, he had no legal jurisdiction to manipulate the blood on the earth because God already did it. In regards to the priesthood, when he, uh, uh, when Moses sprinkled the blood on the on the people and on the uh, and on the altar, it's because the altar, okay, the altar represents God's authority on the earth. The people by worshiping another uh, another god or worshiping uh, an image and building a separate altar, you know, therefore transgress the authority of God, so they deserve death. God forgave them. The Lord gave them a pardon. The Lord gave them remission. But they needed to be restored into the covenant. They needed to be sanctified back to God. That's why the tablets were renewed. They were rewritten. And also, the offering was offered. And that served as a day of atonement, national day of atonement for the people in Exodus. But the one we're talking about here in Leviticus chapter 8 is the separation of Aaron and his sons only to do the work in this sphere over here of the temple, which represents the garden. Now, the Levites were chosen to allow, to help them do to do their work. But the Levites themselves, they were not anointed or they were not ordained and they were not actually placed blood on them to do the work of the priest. So let me ask you a logical question. Where is this so-called ritual that is a legit ritual because the Bible talks about it of uh, a consecration, ordination, and separation for the priests? Where is the same ritual for everyone who's calling themselves the order of Melchizedek? According to the Bible, the only one who is in the order and the similitude of uh, a righteous king, Melchizedek, that's what the, mean, the name means, is actually Yeshua. And he did that in the heavenly tabernacle. Because even the letter to the uh, to the Hebrews tells you that Yeshua could not do it on the earthly tabernacle because there were already priests doing the service according to the law. And in chapter 7, it, it actually tells you that Moses never said anything of anyone uh, in regards from Judah uh, doing anything on the altar. So I do not understand why are we committing encroachment, continue to teach something that is not biblical. Only the sons of Aaron have the authority to be priests on the earth. And only they can do their office when the temple is standing. There are many sons of Aaron running, Aaron running around the world today, but they cannot do their service and their office because there's no altar and there's no temple. Because they were set aside. And the blood here means something. See, many people do not go back to ancient or Eastern context, cultural backgrounds. You need to consider that when you study. Can be, we're going to be missing a lot if we don't consider going to, to the ancient world to understand what blood represents. So let me read you a commentary from the Sundervan uh, Illustrated Bible Commentary. And this is a commentary on um, Exodus 24, 8. Okay? It says, while the purpose of the sprinkling is not entirely clear, we can infer aspects of its meaning. The blood may have created a connection between people and sacrificed animals. 
in a sense. The people are not part of what has been offered to the Lord. The blood also seems to make binding the people's commitment to fulfill the obligations that the agreement imposes on them. Your submission to the uh, to the sprinkling can be compared to a signing of a contract today. Now, this is interesting because watch this. This is this is what really picked my interest. That such of a use of blood relates to a solemn and binding agreement between two parties is partially confirmed by a letter from Mahdi. Mahdi is the area where Jacob lived for about 20 years. Okay. The uh the Mahdi um Ugarit, the Ugarit. Okay, Mahdi which refers to a treaty between Simrilim, the king of Mari, and Shahraya, the king of Rasam. Now, I want you to pay attention to the names and the language of covenant between them both. Watch this. This text advises Simrilim not to help the king of Andarit, who has imperialist, who has imperialist ambitions towards Razama. Remember, these two guys have a treaty. These two guys have a treaty. If anyone tries to superimpose on their treaty, it's causing one to commit treason to the other, and there's war. Okay? And it says, The main motivation of Simrilin to refuse to support the king of Andu uh, Andarid and his troops is the pact of Simrilin has made with Sharraga. This pact is reference when the author of the letter orders Simrilim to tell the king Andarig, there is blood between Shahraya and me. End quote. The letter also refers to those who are part of the agreement as held in blood. It is unknown whether or anyone was sprinkled with blood in the creation of this alliance. But the concept of blood represents the binding nature of what has happened. When I read this in this commentary, it really makes sense. Now, in the same commentary, it says something really interesting. The use of sacrificial blood to sprinkle the people is unusual and appears, and it, uh, and appears elsewhere only in the ordination ceremony of Aaron and his son. That means that what happened in Exodus 24, 8 is unusual. It's not compared to anything. They don't really have any evidence of any engineers sprinkling more blood. But in the Torah, we see that it happened with Israel to come into a covenantal relationship when God forgave them of the transgression of the golden calf. Okay. And then you have Leviticus 8, when God sets aside Aaron and his sons, and he anoints them, he dedicates them, and he sanctifies them for that office. He says, though these symbolic acts, that, uh, through these symbolic acts that indicate that these were the people of God, a special bond was established. It is possible that the 12 erected stones were the ones that actually received the blood splash since they represent the towns uh, and could be splashed. They represent the tribes. But it's interesting. That means that whatever touches blood, whatever touches the blood belongs to God. And because blood is life, whoever sprinkles it in regards to whom for a binding covenantal relationship, no one can touch it. No one can touch that person that has been set aside by God. No weapons form against us shall prosper. Maybe that's why when they try to curse Israel, they're going to be cursed because God ordained for Israel through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to have a covenantal uh, relationship with God forever, ratified with blood. That's why you have the offerings in, uh, uh, in Genesis 15, the covenant of the pieces for the inheritance and the descendants. This is a very, very uh, uh, important topic that we need to examine because the moment that blood is used for something, that means that that person can never be disqualified from their role or their status unless that person themselves chooses to betray the covenantal bond. And that's why Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 uses such a strong language for those who reject Yeshua. Because through Yeshua, we have been purified. 
We have been sanctified. We have been sanctified back to God. How are we sanctified? That means that through the work of resurrection, the resurrection of Yeshua, he was perfected. In other words, he proved that he, he will go through complete obedience and that he was a righteous and a moral man who came from the heavenly realm and he lived like you and I. And therefore, now he defeated death through obedience and God resurrected him and put him on his right hand side, like the book of Hebrews says. And by doing so, now anyone who believes that God resurrected him shall be saved. In other words, you're not going to die because through him, now we have the evidence that death could be defeated. In other words, that the evil intent has no authority in our lives if we are willing to stay in obedience to the God of Israel. I'm telling you, it makes perfect sense now. So therefore, if we accept Yeshua, I don't know what those little things come in the background there. That's kind of weird. <laughs> I'm not doing that. I don't know how that happened. But it looked kind of cool with little stars going behind me. I don't know. That's kind of strange. I didn't do it, okay? So make sure. So, so the book of Hebrews is trying to let you know that if you reject Yeshua, what blood is there to sanctify you back and to enter into the garden? Because God chose him and chose the resurrection of Messiah in order that all men can believe in the God of Israel through Yeshua, who becomes now a high priest. And he ratifies this com uh, covenant, a renewed covenant. Okay, he ratifies it with his blood in the heavenly tabernacle, not on the earthly temple, in the heavenly tabernacle. Okay, is this making sense? Come on, guys. Is this making sense? Okay, we, we lived a whole life. Oh, the blood of Messiah, the blood of Messiah. There are songs about, about the blood of Messiah, the blood of Messiah. But do we really understand what, it, what his purpose, his function, and his whole role was? Listen to what Hebrews chapter 10 says. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you suppose? Would he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified? That's an important word right there, sanctification a common thing, and insulted the spirit of grace. Okay, sanctification. We have been sanctified by the blood of Messiah. Okay, and if we read that carefully, he was sanctified. Okay, if you trample underfoot, but will sanctify. So in other words, when Yeshua goes into the heavenly tabernacle and symbolically sprinkles the blood, not only is Israel restored, it gives now the good news to all of humanity. Adam, all of humanity, you can now return to the garden where the life dwells and death has no authority. And that's why the message of Paul throughout his letters is how resurrection defeated death. That's the message. All right, now, so who, according to the Torah, can manipulate the blood? Let's see. Who, according to the Torah, can manipulate the blood? I'm going to talk about Peter here in a minute. But according to Torah, who can manipulate the blood? If we go to, if we put here the word priest, okay, we can go, immediately we can go to the book of Leviticus. Hold on. Go to the book of uh, four. Oh, wow. That's the priest and the priest. Let me put that. And the priest. It's a lot easier. And the priest. Let's see if I go all the way. Let me make it easier here instead. Let's go to Leviticus. Let's go to the book of Leviticus, chapter 2. Okay, right here. In chapter 2, verse 7 to verse 8. In your, off, in your offer of grain. Now, this is a grain offering. There's no blood here. So let me move on. Chapter 3 says, now if this offering, his offering is an offering of fellowship offering. 
he will bring it to uh, from the cattle, uh, whether male or female. He must bring it without defect before the Lord. He must lay his hands on the head of his animal of the offering and slaughter it at the entrance of the tent of meeting. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall sprinkle the blood on the altar all around. You find it all throughout. Let's continue. Chapter 4. Let's go here on verse 5. The anointed priest shall take some of the bull's blood and she shall bring it to the tent of assembly. And the priest shall dip it, shall dip his finger in the blood and shall spatter some of the blood seven times before the Lord in front of the sanctuary's curtain. The priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the altar of fragrant incense before the Lord, which is in the tent of assembly. And all the rest of his blood must be poured out on the base of the altar of burnt offering, which is at the entrance of the tent of assembly. Now, chapter 4, okay? It tells you, chapter 4, verse 13, forward. Uh, verse 13, verse 17, uh, 16. Then the anointed priest shall bring some of the bull's blood of the tent of assembly, and the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and shall spatter seven times before uh, Adonai in front of the curtain. Okay, and he, and he puts some of the blood on the horn's altar. He goes through the whole thing. Okay, so it's the priest. Chapter 4, the same thing. See, the priest shall take some of the sin offerings, blood with his finger. The Levites are not mentioned here. Although the priests are Levites, not all the Levites are priests. Okay? Now, chapter 4, it continues. The priest shall take some of its blood with his finger and put on the horns of the altar. Chapter 5, the same thing. And the priest shall make atonement for him for his sin. So there was atonement. See, chapter 5 talks about for sin offerings. Okay? So we know that there was forgiveness for sins, and it was the priest who could only manipulate the blood. So this is the reason why Yeshua could not be a priest on the earth and atone for us on the earth. Because the Torah could not provide the solution for death. The Torah, I mean, Moses died. Uh, Aaron died. Let's talk about the righteous men in the Bible. Joseph died. And then during the time of the kings, during the time of the kingdom, there are many righteous men who lived. Zachariah, the father of John the Baptist, he died and he was blameless and he was righteous. So, so when you go back to my study of the Hebrews, I explained in a little bit more detail, but what's the benefit of serving the God of Israel? If the same end, uh, the same, uh, the same, the same, uh, the same conclusion happens for the righteous and the unrighteous. This is why the book of uh, Romans says, for the righteousness of God apart from the law. Because the law, although can give you blessings, if you obey that, if you're in covenant, it gives you the hope. It gave you the hope that I serve the God of creation. So when I die, I'm going to die with a confession of loyalty in my mouth. Hear, o Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Blessed be his name and his kingdom forever and ever. And I'm going to die in the hope that he will restore my life. But we saw the fulfillment of that hope in the resurrection of Yeshua. Because the Torah in itself cannot guarantee when or give you eternal life. That's only up to the king to do. The king says it's time raise him up. And he raised up the Messiah to prove once and for all that it is the God of Israel who has dominion over death. And we have verses to prove that. We have that. Okay? So if we look into Acts chapter 13, verse 36 to 39, it tells you the thing that you could not be justified by the law of Moses, which is the resurrection of the dead. And Galatians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21 clearly tells you that if there was a law that gives you life, then... What is the righteousness then? What do we need the righteousness of God? The righteousness of the law gives you separation, makes you uh, a, a, a peculiar people, gives you a position of honor, gives you uh, uh, blessings, gives you the promises, and gives you the covenantal relationship. But we all still die, so therefore now we have the hope. And that's the hope that chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews is talking about. 
Look it up. The hope is resurrection. Okay? And that's why it keeps mentioning everyone all the way from Cain, I'm sorry, from Abel all the way through because they all have one thing in common. They all died. Okay, but the perfection did not come into Yeshua. Perfection here has to do with the word of being complete. The complete work of Yeshua is that his resurrection will bring an end to dominion of death for anyone who's in the covenant with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Perfect. We understand it. But what ratifies that particular point? The blood. The blood is what separates you from anybody else. And unfortunately, the blood of Jesus has been used so badly by so many people in presenting the gospel to the point they say, well, I've been washed by the blood of Jesus. And by the way, that doesn't line up with the Bible either. Nothing was ever washed in the temple with blood, ever. Nothing. It was either poured on the altar, it was sprinkled. Okay? They will cleanse the, uh, the altar area and the Azra with water. But nothing was washed with blood. That comes from ancient Near Eastern pagan practices. Oh, Rico, but Revelation chapter 1 verse 5 says that we have been washed by the blood of Jesus. Okay, so let's go find out. It's like I always say, talk is cheap, right? You got to go look it up. Hopefully this is making sense. Hopefully it's making sense. But let's, let's read here verse 5. And from Yeshua the Messiah, faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth to the one who loved us and released us. It's not using the word wash. In this version, which is the Lexham, it uses the word release. That's a big difference, wash from release. So what I'm going to do is I want you to see it for yourselves. I'm going to put it here in study. And then we're going to open the word in the Greek. Now, notice, is the word to loose, untie, release, Loosen, unbind, unfasten. Okay, now listen to this. This particular commentary is a really important one. And, and this one right here, which is the, um, yeah, I want to show you which one it is. Which is the Greek-English lexicon of the New Testament. All right. Is using that word and is going a little further with it. It's actually saying that is... Let me go back. It's easier to see here. It says, to lose, untie, set free, untie, destroy, bring to an end, abolish. Now, you see this pie chart here? That pie chart is very important. Because it's telling you exactly how that word is used in the New Testament. Throughout the New Testament. And then when I hit, when I hit one of the colors, it gives me the verses and how they are used. Okay, now I want you to notice that not once is the use of that particular Greek word in the New Testament as washed. It's used every place else as released, released, destroyed, broken, break, breaking, broken up, abolished, removed, brought to an end, free, untie, untied, untied. Maybe it's used on this one. Oh, in Ephesians, it says broke down. It's used as broke down. Don't you find it interesting that there's not one time that word that everyone says washed in the blood, it actually is used as release and never as washed in any other instant in the New Testament? How many of you did not know that? Show, put in the chat here on Facebook and also here in the chat. How many of you did not know that? That is no evidence whatsoever in the New Testament that is used in any other way other than released. You know how much flack I've gotten from people when I mention this about being washed and not washed in the blood? <laughs> One person called me heretic because I said that we're not washed in the blood, that we're sprinkled by his blood. And it's only mentioned in the book of Hebrews, by the way, in 1 Peter. And I submit something to you. When we go to 1 Peter, he's not even talking to the, to the, uh, to the Gentiles. He's talking to the Israelites, the one of the diaspora, the dispersion. Because the Gentiles, unless you're in covenant with God, how can you be sprinkled by the blood of a covenant if you're not in covenant with God? And Gentile nations were never in covenant with God. It's only Israel. So when you go to uh, um, 1 Peter, 
chapter 1 says, Peter, an apostle of Yeshua, the Messiah, to a chosen. To the chosen. Okay? The elect. The elect who are residing temporarily in the dispersion. Okay? In Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, as modern-day Turkey, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, by the sanctification, a very important word, by the sanctification of the Spirit, that word should be agiasmo, sanctification, holiness, consecration. It says, according to the... Um, for obedience, and for sprinkling with the blood of Yeshua. Wait a minute. The sprinkling of the blood of Yeshua, the Messiah, is for sanctification. Because they're in the diaspora. He's talking to the ten tribes of Israel. They're scattered abroad. Remember, if you read the book of Hosea, it gives you an inference to the, to the, the, the problem with the northern kingdom. It went into the, the uh, rebellion, just like the parable of the uh, of the prodigal son and, uh, and, and all the things that are, are going on in the New Testament, trying to give you uh, a story about the condition of Israel in their dispersion, in their disobedience, in their rebellion. Okay? I'm going to keep reading. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Yeshua the Messiah, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again. Wait a minute. How are we born again? Ah, to a living hope through the resurrection of Yeshua from the dead. So when we believe in, Yeshua, in God the Father as the one who resurrected Yeshua, and if we believe Yeshua is our master, then we are born again because now death has no authority in our lives. But baptism becomes a symbolism, the rite of passage of that transition that we're waiting for and that hope. To an inheritance imperishable and undefiled and unfading, unfading, reserved in heaven for you who are being protected by the power of God through faith, through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in this last in the last time. In which you rejoice greatly, although now for a short time, if necessary, you are distressed by various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more valuable than gold that is passing away, be is, but is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and honor and glory at the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah, whom although you have not seen, you love, in whom now you believe, although you do not see him. And you rejoice greatly with joy inexpressible and full of glory, obtaining the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. See? It's about eternal life. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace meant for you sought and made careful inquiry, investigating for what person or by which time the spirit of Messiah in them was indicating he when he testified beforehand to the suffering with reference to Messiah and the glories after these things, to whom it was revealed that they were serving not themselves, but you with reference to the same things by which now have been announced to, the, uh, to you through those who proclaim the good news, the gospel, to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, Things into which angels desire to look. Now, he goes into uh, living uh, hol holy lives. Because living holy lives is what gives, keeps you in the realm of life. God already promised eternal life. He gave you the gift. You can reject it. If you continue to go into the realm of death, rebelling against God. If you rebel against God, you're transgressing the covenant. And then if you willfully transgress the covenant then what blood is there to restore your relationship? Okay? So, though I do not believe once saved, always saved, I think a person can reject their gift of salvation by their behavior and turning their backs completely on God and never returning. But then the other ones will repent and God accepts them back. Okay? In obedient children, do not be conformed to the former desires you used to conform to in your ignorance. But as the one who, who called you is holy, you yourselves be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, you will be holy because I am holy. This is from the Torah portion of Kedoshim. We already established that it's not talking to the Israelites. I'm sorry, 
It's not talking to the Gentiles. It's talking to the sons of Israel that are scattered abroad. It's not talking to Gentile people here, guys. Okay, the language is different. So when you are from the nations and you quote me 1 Peter chapter 2 to say I'm a royal priesthood now in the order of Melchizedek, that is not the context of the letter. That is not the audience. You are not the audience intended for the letter. Letter Plus Melchizedek does not appear in 1 Peter anywhere. Let's stop reinventing the wheel and adding things that are not there in the text. We did that in the church. Let's stop going back to it. Okay. It says, for it is written, you will be holy because I am holy. And if, if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to uh, each, uh, each one's work, conduct yourselves with fear during the time of your temporary residence. That means your life. Because you know that you were redeemed from your futile way of life, inherited for, from your ancestors, not to perishable things like silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Yeshua, uh, of Messiah, like one of an unblemished and spotless, uh, spotless lamb. He is saying, you have brought near back to God. Israel, the ten tribes scattered. But remember, you have been brought near through the blood of Yeshua because the penalty of the northern kingdom was death. They rebelled against God completely. Right? Okay, so it says, who was foreknown before the foundation of the earth, the foundation of the world, but has been revealed in this last day, in the last times for you, who through him are believing in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in you. Who raised Yeshua here? God raised Yeshua from the dead. It's kind of clear. It says, having purified your souls, purification, again, purification, okay, by your obedience through this, uh, to the truth for the sincere brotherly love, love one another fervently from the heart because you have been born again, not from perishable seed, but imperishable through the living and enduring word of God for all flesh is like grass. He's quoting Isaiah now. says, in all of, its gl all of its glory like the flower of the grass, the grass withers and the flowers fall off, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Okay. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 6 and 8. And this is the word that has been proclaimed to you. Now, let's continue the sequence. Chapter 2. Therefore, right, uh, ridding yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the unadulterated spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up to salvation. If you have tasted that the Lord is kind, to whom you are drawing near, a living stone rejected by man, but chosen and precious in the sight of God. And you yourselves as living stones are built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. Okay? Doesn't say Melchizedek. Anywhere. And it's talking to the Israelites, not the Gentile. That's the audience. Okay. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Yeshua the Messiah, for it stands in Scripture, Behold, I laid in Zion, Zion, a stone, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Therefore, the honor is for you who believe and for those who refuse to believe. The stone that the builders rejected, this one has become the cornerstone, and a stone stumbling and a rock of offense. Now watch. Who stumble because they disobey the word which they also... To which, they, to which also they were consigned. But you are a, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's possession. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. He's not talking to Gentiles here. The Gentiles have never been a chosen race, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. It's always been Israel. So why do we take 1 Peter and apply it to people coming from the nations when the original intended audience of the letter was for already the children of Israel. I'm not saying that we're not adapted into the kingdom. And I am not saying that we're not going to be part of the chosen race and the royal priesthood and the holy nation. I'm talking about the context of the letter in itself. It's talking about Exodus 19.5. When God gave the offer to Israel, if you obey my covenant, if you live according to my covenant, I will make you a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. 
okay, holy nation, set aside to me. And then what Moses did, he ratified it and he sprinkled the blood on the altar on the people, making and indexing a connective bond of covenant that nothing can separate Israel from God the moment that blood touched the altar. Now the Lord had the right to bring judgment against Israel because they accepted the covenant and they willfully rejected the covenant. Therefore now they are penalties of transgression and treason. But they agreed to those terms in Deuteronomy chapter 27 and 28 and Leviticus chapter 20, uh, 26 and uh, yeah, 20, 25 and 26. No, I'm sorry. 26, I think it is. And 27 when you have the curses and the blessings. All right. So he's talking here. And then he quotes the book of Hosea to really emphasize the point that he's now speaking to Gentile audience in this letter. Is this making sense to you guys? Is this making sense or is it just me? Come on now, help me out. We need to learn context. Context, context, context. And the evidence establishes truth. Now your own understanding. This is about what God says in his Bible in context. And, hey, don't believe me. Go back and look it up. Okay? It said, but you are a chosen race, a royal priest, and a holy nation, a people of God's possession, so that you may be proclaimed the virtues of of the one who called you out of darkness, here means uh, death, into the marvelous light, which means life. Who was once were not a people, but now the people of God, who were once not chosen, show mercy, but are now have shown mercy. This is the book of Hosea. Hosea chapter 1, verse 6 and verse 9, and chapter 2, verse 23. Okay? Now watch, watch this. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and temporary residents. Residents of where? This proves my point. It says, to abstain from fleshly desires which wage war against your souls, maintaining your good contact among the Gentiles. But wait a second. If they're Gentiles, why is it saying this? So in that in the things of which you, uh, they slander you as evildoers by seeing your good deeds, they may glorify God on the, on the day of visitation. This verse 11 proves my point. Let me highlight it here because I'm sure I'm going to use it again. So are we usurping the authority that God has given certain people using verses out of context saying that now everyone's a priest in the Oro Melchizedek? That, by the way, that's only one of the few places that it uses the word sprinkle the blood. First Peter, and it's always in reference to Israel because we already saw that in Exodus chapter 24, God already did that through Moses when the blood sprinkled the people on the altar. Did that make sense? Exodus, uh, Isaiah 43. It says, The animals of the field will honor me, jackals and daughters of ostrich. I will give water to the world in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to gift a drink to my chosen people, that's Israel. Verse 21, this people who I formed for myself, that they make, that they might make known my praise. Talking about Israel. Isaiah 61, 6, where you shall be called priests of the Lord, and you will be called servers of our God, and you shall eat the wealth of the nations, and you shall boast in their riches. Well, guess what? Wasn't Israel a royal race, a royal priesthood, and they're coming back from the dispersion? There are people of status. Revelation 1, 6. And made us a kingdom of priests to his, to his God and Father. Because that's the original covenant, to be a nation of priests. But it doesn't mean that they can officiate in the temple. I got a question for the room. How come they cannot officiate in the temple? Although we will be restored as a royal kingdom and uh, office. Um, sorry as a royal kingdom and a chosen race, when we brought back to the land of Israel, the question is, will, be, will we be able to officiate in the temple according to Torah? Ezekiel chapter 44 verse 15 says, no, only the sons of Sadok, the Levites, the sons of Sadok, which are the sons of Aaron. They're the only ones who can officiate in the temple. Why is this? Because God already, already, uh, uh, separated them, anointed them, uh, and put oil and blood in their ear, in their thumb, and on their big toe. 
In other words, the only people who can officiate in the temple and dealing with the offerings are the priests because God already ordained them to do that work and no one else. And as long as we are on the earth, the writer of the Hebrews agrees with what I'm saying. If Yeshua were not, was on earth, he would not be a priest. For they're already priests according to the law. So that begs the question. Yeshua resurrects. He never mentions priesthood. For 40 days, talking to the disciples, not one word of a new priesthood, of doing away with the law, doing away with the temple. Not one word. 40 years. The temple stood after Yeshua died and resurrected. James, not a word against the priesthood, not a word against the Torah, not a word against sacrifices. Paul, not a word against the priesthood, not a word against the Torah. As a matter of fact, when he, when he got slapped, when he got arrested and he got slapped, and he says something, offending the person that he said something to, when he found out it was the high priest, he immediately repented. Why would he do that? 20 years after Yeshua died and resurrects. Come on, guys, we have to wait out the evidence. We have to wait out. If I'm wrong, I'm willing to, to change. I don't have a problem with this. But I don't see the evidence anywhere that said this because God already set aside certain people to do the work. This is not about defending the sons of Aaron. This is about establishing what is truth. If God says, these are the people that I set aside, then why are we fighting against that? What is the problem of what God says? I don't understand. I, don't, I really do not get it. So let's go back to the teaching here real quick. All right, so we talked about 1 Peter. Now remember, the word uh, uh, purified, the word purified, I, I'm sorry, I completely, I didn't put it here in English. I have this teaching in Spanish. But it's interesting that the word sprinkled is found in the book of Hebrews 9.13, 9.19, 9.21, Hebrews 10.22, 9.13, 9.19. It's purified or, or sprinkled. And then in the book of First Peter, that's it. You're not going to find that anywhere in the New Testament. And it's interesting that the book of Hebrews is talking in the context of the Day of Atonement. It's in the Day of Atonement. Now, let me read you from, let me go down here real quick. And I'm going to read from, I was the first verse. First, I, I omitted this. In Leviticus 16, verse 15, and actually we should go here and we should read a little bit more. Let's read from verse 11 all the way down to verse 30. I want you to see something. What I want you to notice is what brings what brings defilement to the temple? What causes the temple to be defiled? Is it demons or is it the sins of Israel? What does the Bible say? Let's find out. It says, And Aaron shall present the sin offering, uh, uh, sin offerings bull, which is for which is for himself. So he shall make atonement for himself and for his family. Then he shall slaughter a sin offering bull, which is for himself. And he shall take a censer full of burning coals. For upon the altar from before the Lord, two handfuls of incense, powerful fragrant perfumes, shall bring it behind the curtain. And he shall put the incense on the, uh, on the fire before the Lord, so that the cloud of incense may cover the atonement cover, which is on the covenant text. So that he may not die. So he needed to go to a procedure. So he had to do an offering for himself, for his family, and then for the, all the people. It had to follow in that sequence. Individual, communal, and then national. Okay? All right. Verse 14. He shall take some of the bull's blood and he shall spatter it with his fingers on the atonement cover, uh, cover's surface on the eastern side. And before the atonement cover, he shall spatter some of the blood with his fingers seven times. So this is the day of atonement, Yom HaKippurim, okay? And he shall slaughter the sin offerings goat, which is for the people, you see? One is for himself, for the people. He shall bring it to the blood, shall bring its blood from behind the curtain. And he shall, um, he shall do with his blood as that which he did with the, blood, the, blood's bull, uh, the bull's blood. 
and he shall spatter it uh, on the atonement cover and before the atonement cover. Thus, he shall make atonement for the sanctuary from the Israelites' impurities and from their transgressions for all of their sins. And so he must do for the tent of assembly, which dwells with them in the midst of their impurity. Guys, listen to what it says, verse 17. And no person shall be in the tent of assembly when he enters to make atonement in the sanctuary until he comes out. And so he shall make atonement for himself and for his family and for all of Israel's assembly. Like I told you earlier. Only God can render remission at an individual, communal, and national level. So what defiles the temple is the sins of Israel, not the demons. That's what the ancient world believed in Egypt and Mesopotamia and in the ancient world. Demons defiled sacred space in the ancient world. In Israel's different is the sin of Israel. How can we prove this? From the moment in the book of Exodus when Moses sprinkled the blood on the people and on the altar. From that moment on, what defiles the altar and the sanctuary is Israel's behavior, not the demons. Did that make sense to you guys? Let's keep reading. He's going to reiterate that later. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord. He shall make atonement for it. He shall take some of its blood, uh, of the bull's blood, and some of the goat's blood. He shall put it all around the altar's horn, and he shall spatter on the blood that is seven times with, a seven, uh, with his finger. He shall cleanse it and consecrate it, for, consecrate it from the Israelites' impurities. Let me read this again. He shall spatter some of the blood on his seven times with his finger, and he shall cleanse it and consecrate it. What is that Hebrew word here? Kadosh. Make it holy again. Dedicate, sanctify, set apart. That's how the word perfected is used in the book of Hebrews. Instead of the, of the, uh, the blood of bulls and goats on the earth, like the book of Hebrews says, that one cannot take away death. The temple cannot take away death. All the people once a year will meet up and they will ask God for forgiveness and God will do it annually. But the writer of Hebrews is saying, God is going to do something new. He's going to renew the, heaven, the covenant with Israel through a new way. In this case, the temple is going to be destroyed. So what Yeshua will do for us outside the scope of this earth not only bringing remission for Israel to return to the garden where there's no death, but also humanity to return to the garden because in the garden there's no death. That's why the book of Revelation ends, chapter 21, verse 1 through 4, that there's no death. And that's why 1 Corinthians 15, chapter uh, verse 1 through uh, verse 52 says death has been defeated. The temple cannot take care of that problem. That's why Yeshua could not die inside the temple. It will be considered human sacrifice. But what he did outside the temple was to uh, be an innocent man who was righteous, who was moral. He was wrongly accused. Just like all of us have been accused by the devil when we were born into this earth. Although we may live righteous and moral lives according to the Torah, all of humanity is destined for death until Messiah returns by the will of the Father to resurrect us because he already proved that death is no longer having any power over the righteous and the, the moral people, according to the Torah. And that's what Torah did for us. Allows us to come into the realm of holiness, separation. So hear what it says. And he shall spatter some of the blood on a seven times with his finger, and he shall cleanse it and consecrate it from the Israelites' impurities. Remember, the Day of Atonement is for Lekulam, for all of them. The work of Yeshua is not only for Israel. It starts with Israel, but it's going to now give the good news to humanity. Hey, you can, you can come back through the work of Yeshua, the resurrection. That's why Paul wrote it beautifully in chapter 10, verse 9. 
that if you confess with your mouth that Yeshua is now your master and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That formula, the way he wrote, is perfect to the ancient world in Rome, to the people in the Greco-Roman society. They needed to reject the authority of the emperor and they needed to recognize that the emperor had no authority over life and death. It's only the God of Israel who resurrected his son to eliminate any imperial powers. Okay, verse 20, and you shall finish making atonement for the sanctuary and the tent of assembly and the altar. Then he shall present a living goat. Now watch. Now he cleansed the temple from the impurities of the people. But there's still impurities. Psychologically, think about this. Where are those impurities going to go? Ah, the penalty of transgressing sacred space was death. God says, my sacred space is cleansed from your sins that by you defiling my sacred space deserves, deserves death. So what am I going to do? Hey, guys, I'm going to show you what I plan to do. You see that scapegoat over there? Now the priest is going to put both hands on it. He's going to lean on it, and he's going to confess the sins of himself, his family, and all of Israel. And that scapegoat is the one that's going to go in the wilderness and is going to go back to the one who caused Adam to sin. He's going to bear the guilt because of your repentance. He, God, gave you a remission, gave you a uh, gave you a, uh, a remission from a sickness there was no cure for, which is death. And now the Lord is going to bring you back into His sacred space by making you a peculiar people, a royal kingdom, a royal priesthood, and, and a, a kingdom of status. That's what priests were represented in the ancient Near East, status. God chose the sons of Aaron to do that work, to work in the temple. Okay? Now, and Aaron shall place his two hands on the living goat's head, and he shall confess over it all the Israelites' iniquities and all their transgressions for all their sins, and he shall put them on the head of the goat's head, and he shall send it away into the desert with the men standing ready. Thus the goat shall bear on it to a barren region all their guilt, all, uh, and he shall send the goat away to the desert. Desert means uh, chaos, shame, uh, uh, exiled. It means death. That's why at the end, Satan, the devil, the serpent is going to die. Okay, eternal. Whoever. Okay. It's never going to be known. Again, no more no more death. That's really what it is. Okay, this is the whole the purpose of Yeshua's uh, um, uh, death, burial, and resurrection. And this verse right here. That's why the book of Hebrews is using in the context of the Day of Atonement to give you the understanding that the, in the Day of Atonement, only the high priest can intercede on, on behalf of all of Israel. The writer of Hebrews is making a contrast between what the Torah could do and then what the Torah could not do through the priesthood and what now Yeshua could do in the heavenly tabernacle. Because in the heavenly tabernacle, you know, the priest cannot enter. The sons of Aaron cannot go. On the earthly tabernacle, Yeshua cannot enter because the laws according to the holy things in the temple belong to the priest and his sons because they were already set aside by blood to do so. Hopefully this makes sense, guys. Let's continue. And Aaron shall enter the tent of assembly. He shall take off the linen garments that he put on. Uh, 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 he put on his uh, his coming to the sanctuary. He shall leave them there, and he shall wash his body with water in a holy place. He shall put on his garments and go out and sacrifice his burnt offering and the people's burnt offering. And he shall make atonement for himself and for the people. And he must turn into smoke the sins, the sin offerings fat on the altar. Now watch. And the person who sent out the goat for Azazel shall wash his garments, shall wash his body with uh, his body with water, and afterwards he, he shall come into camp. And the sin offerings bulls and the sin offerings uh, offerings goat, whose blood was brought to make atonement in the sanctuary, shall be brought outside the camp. And they shall burn their hide and their blood and their offal in the fire. And the person who burns them shall wash his garments and he shall wash his body with water 
and afterwards he must come to camp. I want to read this again. Remember, the one for Azazel, none of that animal came into the temple, neither the blood or the animal. The, 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 the animal was alive when it was sent away. How about the other goat? There were two, remember? They look exactly the same. Only the blood of that goat was taken into the Holy of Holies. And that's what's trying to explain to you here. And the body was taken outside the camp. It cannot be put on the altar, but the blood was. Watch. It says, and the sins, and the sin offerings bulls, and the sins, and the sin offerings bull, and the sin offerings goat, whose blood was brought to make atonement in the sanctuary, shall be brought outside the camp. And they shall burn their hide and their flesh and their offal in the fire. Not in the temple, in the camp. Only the blood went in to do what? To ratify the people once and for all. Not once and for all, I'm sorry. In the day of atonement, to ratify the people, to renew year, to ask, at year after year that covenantal relationship, ratifying with blood. Remember that it was Israel defiling God's altar. And how do you defile the altar? By transgressing the commandment, which equals death. But then God says, I'll give you grace. I'll renew it. I'll forgive you. And as a nation, I'll forgive you. Now watch, it says, and the person who burns them shall wash his garment and he shall wash his body with water and afterward he must come to the camp. And after this, and, and this shall be a lasting statue for you for in the seventh month and the tenth of the month, you must deny yourselves and you must do no, not any work, whether the native or the alien who is dwelling in your midst, because, watch this, because on this day, he shall make atonement for you to cleanse you. And you must be clean from all your sins before the Lord. So what defiles the temple? Verse 32. And the priest who is anointed and who is ordained to serve as a priest in place of his father shall make atonement. Thus he shall put on the linen garments, the holy garments. He shall make atonement for the sanctuary's holy place. And he shall make atonement for the tent of assembly and the altar. And he shall make atonement for the priest and for all the assembly's people. That's the purpose of the day of atonement. To cleanse everyone of their sins. So there was forgiveness of sin in the Bible. So when a Jewish guy says, hey, the Torah talks about forgiveness of sins. When you tell a Jewish person, Jesus died for all my sins. Where well, a Jewish guy who knows the temple and knows the Torah is going to say, wait a minute. There was already forgiveness in the temple for sins. What are you going to tell him? You got to give him an answer. Because Yeshua did come to die to redeem us, humanity and Israel, from the one thing that the Torah cannot do. Death. That's what the resurrection. Now, if we read, let's go here real quick. If we read Acts, let's go to the book of Acts. Hopefully this is making sense, guys. I pray this is a blessing to you, really. I, I'm trying to keep it as simple as I can. I get all excited, I know. But, I mean, I understand it finally for the first time in so long. I get it. I understand the importance of the blood and why the blood is so significant. But you should not be throwing it around without knowing its meaning. Because it has purpose. Okay, it's a, a form of ratifying, making something stronger. Not the not, not by the blood of the animals done in the temple, but by the blood of Yeshua. Why is that why the contrast in the book of Hebrews? Because the blood of the animals in the temple was not for doing away from death. It was to cleanse the temple from the impurity of the people. Let's read so, uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 36. Pay attention to says in verse 38 and 39. It says, For David, after serving the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was buried with his fathers and experienced decay. But he whom God raised up did not experience decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, men and brothers, that through this one, Yeshua, forgiveness. Oh, what? wait a minute. The word forgiveness is aphesis, a pardon, a dismissal. 
a cancellation, a release. Okay? Forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Watch. This is the key. And I need your help here in the chat. Tell me if you see it. Tell me if you've seen this before or not. Okay, it says, <clears throat> proclaim to you from all the things from which you were not able to be justified by the law of Moses. Could you be justified by the law of Moses that you will not die? I want to know that. What does uh, the book of Acts chapter 3, verse 23 says? Let's go there. I'm sorry. Uh, Galatians. The book of Galatians chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. It says, Now the mediator is not for one, but God is one. Therefore, is the law opposed to the promises of God? May it never be. For if a law have been given that was able to give life, certainly righteousness would have been from the law. So what? watch this. But the scripture imprisoned all under sin in order that the promise could be given by faith in Yeshua the Messiah to those who believe. So the sin that Paul is talking about here is death. That's the one that we are free from. Romans chapter 3, verse 20 and 21. Listen to what it says. But now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been revealed, being testified about by the law and the prophets. That is, the righteousness of God through faith in Yeshua the Messiah to all who believe, for there is no distinction. Now, this is the key here, verse 23 and 24. For all have sinned and for short glory, for short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace. We are justified to come into His kingdom through Yeshua the Messiah, because we all are, were destined for death. But through the resurrection, if we believe God resurrected Yeshua, then now we receive the gift for our loyalty and our allegiance. Watch, verse 23 and 24. For we are all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by His grace, through the redemption by which is in Yeshua the Messiah, whom God made publicly available as the mercy seat. Now, do me a favor. Look in your Bibles real quickly. Look in your Bibles. Where, how many of your Bibles does it say propitiation? Some Bible says propitiation. Come on now, help me out. How many of your Bibles says propitiation? Here is a direct translation. Mercy seat is using the language of Yom Kippur. But how many of you have read in your Bibles, in Spanish and in English, propitiation, and you never thought about the Day of Atonement. Come on now, help me out, guys. You're here in the chat, either Facebook or here in Zoom, right? How many of you really never understood that it's not talking about regular sacrifices? It's using the language of Yom Kippur. Through faith in his blood. You see that? Who God made it public, the uh, made it publicly available as the mercy seat, propitiation. Remember, the high priest will bring the blood of that of that goat to ratify the covenant. And it says, through his through faith in his blood, for a demonstration of his righteousness, it's a gift of God. He's given us sadaka, he's given us a gift because of the passing over of previously committed sins. And then watch, for in the forbearance of God, for the demonstration of his righteousness in the present time, so that he should be just, and the one who justifies the person by faith in Yeshua. That means that we have received a gift. That doesn't mean that the word that the Torah is done away with. It means that God has found a way to restore humanity, although the Torah did not give you the answer. Did not have sacrifices to keep you from dying. It had offerings to maintain your relationship while you live on the earth. But then when you die, you die with the hope. That's what the hope that is talking about in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. The hope of things not seen. That's resurrection. That's why Yeshua came and one of the signs of Yeshua's uh, ministry was the resurrection of the dead. The little girl in the house in the northern kingdom, remember? 
How old was she? She was 12 years old. Why do we need to know she was 12 years old? To let us know that the house that he entered where death reigned, therefore that little girl represents Israel in her state of impurity. Which impurity? Death. And she was resurrected. And it says, oh, she sleeps. Why does it say she sleeps? When she was actually dead. Because sleep in the Bible is synonymous with death. Just like Moses slept with his fathers, and Abraham slept with his fathers, and uh, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob slept with their fathers. Therefore, resurrection will come through Yeshua, the Messiah. That's one of the functions of Mashiach. Is this making sense? I hope it is. So, what is the purpose of blood? Is this making sense? The purpose of the blood is to consecrate. So when God consecrated the leper, remember? There was a rite of passage. It's quite, it's, it's quite interesting how a leper means death, remember? Death men walking. And they, they cannot go in the temple. They, can, they cannot go to the city or Jerusalem. Because the city represented the realm of life. The walls were holy. Anything inside the city walls was holy. A leper cannot go in. He represented death. But when there's healing, he had to go through a rite of passage. He had to spend a certain amount of days doing certain things. And then he had to go in and he had to be sprinkled with the ashes of the red heifer and waters of purification. Right? And then once he went through all that ritual, take about seven, eight days, right? Then he will go to the temple and in the temple and the Nicanor gate, they will do the same ritual they did for the priests. Now, it doesn't mean that this leper now, who's going to change his status, he's going to go from outside the camp to uh, uh, to what inside the camp, incorporation ritual. It doesn't mean that once they put the oil and the blood and the ear and the thumb and the big toe, that he's going to be a priest of Aaron now. It doesn't mean that. It means that he comes into the family of Israel with full honors. That's why the Lord chose the ritual of the high priest in their inauguration and their incorporation into the priesthood as a way to incorporate a leper who was healed into the community to say that no one can ever call this guy a leper again because that will be a shameful thing to call him to live in the realm of death when he is in the temple now. By the way, that's why the sign of Moses, he went to the Israelites in the wilderness, in Egypt, I'm sorry. What did he say? What did he do? Two signs. The staff and the hand, lepers, lepers, hand, remember? He put it in the bosom, leprosy. He put it back, it's healed. But that sign was not for the Egyptians. That sign was for the Israelites. Because God was going to heal them from death, slavery, shame, exiles. And that's the whole message about Israel coming out of Egypt, just us coming out of the nations through the healing of leprosy, death, through Yeshua, the Messiah, who sits now at the right hand of the Father. Okay? There's so much more. I wish I had more time. I have to hurry up because I got to leave here soon. And uh, I pray that this is a blessing to you. There's more to look into. There's more to study. But I, I highly recommend you take time to study the temple, guys. We don't do enough of that. That's why we're so confused. Okay, because of death. Watch in Numbers chapter 19, verse 14 to verse 20. The key of the red heifer is for purification. Okay, listen, this is the law when a man dies in a tent. Everyone who enters the tent and everyone who is in the tent will be unclean for seven days. When death entered the world through Adam eating of the fruit, all of humanity now, the whole tent of God, all of humanity is defiled. God's temple, which is the earth, is defiled with death. That's why in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 1 through, uh, through 4 says, and, in, and you renew heavens and you renew earth, new heaven and earth, and there will be no more sea, no more chaos. And then verse 4 says, and death will be no more. That's why God is coming to dwell on the earth after the thousand years when death no longer has any authority whatsoever. 
because then he can dwell just like in the temple. He, his presence can dwell in the tabernacle in the temple when there was no connection with death to show us that God wants to restore his sacred space. That's what the temple is. It's a microcosm of what he will do in the whole world in the future. It says seven days, seven days, unclean for seven days. And every open vessel that was not uh, that does not have the cover tied over it will be unclean in the same way. Anyone who is in an open field touches someone who has been killed by a sword, who has died of natural causes, who, who touches a human bone, a grave, or an unclean seven days. Then for the for unclean person, they will take some of the ashes of what was burned for purification from sin. So Yeshua will be a type of the red heifer for purification. Not for salvation. Salvation is the gift. Save from what? Death. That's what God is doing. He's given us the remission so we can come into eternity. Get to live. It says, then for the unclean person, they will take some of the ashes that was burned uh, for purification from sin. And they will pour running water on it on the vessel. And a clean person will take his up and dip it with water and sprinkle it on the tent and all the furniture and all the people who were there and on the one who touched the bones and the dead man and the one who was dying do natural causes or the grave. Then the person and then the clean person will sprinkle on the unclean person on the third and seven days. On the seventh day, he will be cleansed. He cleansed him from uncleanness. And he will wash his, uh, his clothes and bathe in water. He will be clean when evening comes. But the man who is unclean and has now purified himself from his uncleanness, that person will be cut off from the midst of the assembly because he has defiled the sanctuary of the Lord. The water of impu for impurity has now been sprinkled on him. It is unclean. Okay. Now, chapter 21 of the book of Revelation, verse 1 through 4, shows this. And I saw new heaven and new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down from God, out of heaven, prepare as a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice saying, From the throne, behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among, men, among them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be among them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there will be no more death. Nor will there be any more mourning, crying, pain. Because the first things have passed away. The problem is the word sin. Uh, Jacob Milgram, who studied the book of Leviticus for th over 30 years. is a conservative rabbi. Scholar, ancient Near Eastern scholar, highly regarded in the topic of the book of, uh, in the context of the book of Leviticus, it says the purification offering. It says this chapter and the next deals with two atoning sacrifices: the purification offering and the separation offering. These offerings, unlike the previous ones in chapter one and three, are obligatory. They atone for sin, the violation of a prohibitive commandment, or a the violation of sanctuaries. Violation of a prohibited commandment defiles the sanctuary. And unless the sanctuary is purged by a purification offering, the community is in danger of having its God forced to abandon the sanctuary. This is the reason why Adam was thrown out of the garden. Because he defiled the garden, God's sacred space. And the problem is the definition, the problem is the definition of Chatat. Okay? People really are not understanding what that, what that word sin is. Since the term chatat is traditionally translated as sin offering. However, this translate, translation poses difficulties in integrating the dual function of offerings to address both ethical sin and situations in which such sin is not contemplated. The, norm, the norms of cultic impurities um, Milgram understands impurity as a quasi-material entity that threatens the sacred sanctuary. The function of the chata, the sin, uh, is to cleanse it of such contamination. The function of the offering, chatat, is to cleanse it of the contamination. 
Hence the proposal, the purification offering. That's what it's called. It should be called instead of sin. So what Yeshua come to do is purify us. He purified. He, he basically uh, consecrated us from the realm of death into the realm of life. Amen? So proper definitions helps out a lot in order for us to understand these things. And these are the verses in which now speaks about remission and also sprinkling of the blood. Okay? Hebrews 9.19 Hebrews 9, 11 talks about this whole, uh, how he has, uh, let's read them. Watch this. Let's read them as well. We've been spending an hour already. So let's read it. This is important. For when Moses had finished giving all the commandments to all the people, that's what it says in Hebrews 9, 19. That's what really caught my attention. Rereading it during my, my research on the book of Hebrews that allowed me to understand it a little bit more. It says, for when Moses had finished giving all the commandments to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and the goats with water, scarlet wool, hyssop, and sprinkling the book itself and all the village. And in, in this case, it's a translation, but all the people. Okay, and by the way, I know there's a teaching out there uh, that the book of Hebrews should not be in the Bible. Um, they don't know what they're talking about. The book of Hebrews clearly should be in the Bible. It's beautifully written, and it talks about the one thing. It teaches us why Yeshua needed to die and resurrect. So we need to... Pick carefully who we're going to listen to in regards to these things, okay? And in the same way, he sprinkled blood on both the tabernacle and all the utensils of the ministry. And according to the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of the blood, there's no forgiveness. Remember, the word forgiveness is aphesis. Okay, remember that. It's aphesis. Okay? When you look it up, it's aphesis. It says, but when Messiah, this is another verse, verse 11, Talks about blood. It says, For when Messiah appears as a high priest of the good things to come through a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he's going to do it in the heavenly tabernacle. Why? Because the earthly tabernacle could not take care of the issue with, uh, with death. Okay? It can defy, uh, cleanse the temple from the impurities, but everyone eventually will die anyway. Okay? And not by the blood of goats and, uh, and calves, but by his own blood, he entered the most holy place once and for all, having obtained eternal redemption. That's why it says once and for all, because now death is defeated. He's not saying that Torah is done away with. And he's not saying that if we are on the earth and Israel's is returning to the land and there's an altar that the priest cannot do their service. He's talking about the only thing that the earthly tabernacle cannot do. Yeshua did for us, but not on the earthly tabernacle, only in the heavenly tabernacle. For if the blood of bull and go bulls and goats and the ashes of the red heifer sprinkled on those who, are, who have defiled themselves, sanctify for the purification of the flesh in order for people to go into the temple, how much more will the blood of Messiah, who through the eternal spirit offered himself blameless to God, purify your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? In other words, we no longer have to wonder if we're going to have resurrection, he already proved that through the resurrection of Yeshua that we have now conquered death by the work of Yeshua, resurrection, that God allowed his son to resurrect in order that now he can give us a gift of salvation. Therefore, he is the mediator of a new covenant. Who's the mediator? Messiah. So that, the, so that, so that a death having taken place for the redemption of the transgression that was committed under the first covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. By the way, you see this verse right here? You're going to get the answer to that verse in Romans chapter 3 to chapter 9. It's going to tell you the law of sin and death. When it's talking about the sin, the transgression of the first covenant, it's talking about all the way back to Adam. Remember, the writer assumes everyone knows this. Okay, 1128, by faith, he celebrated Passover and the sprinkling of blood so that the destroyer, see, death of the firstborn would not touch them. Okay, that caused death to the Israelites. So when they believe in the blood of that lamb on the doorpost, which is a covenantal threshold covenant, death will have no authority in that house. That's why they were passed over. It's about resurrection, guys. 
that message is resurrection. Hebrews 12, 24, and Yeshua, the mediator of a new covenant, and the sprinkled blood that speaks better than the blood of Abel. The word better means stronger. That's Hebrews 12, 24. Let me go look that up. I want to make sure I'm right on this one. Hebrews 12, 24. Hebrews 12, 24. Twelve twenty four, and to Yeshua, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks better than Abel does. See what the word here is. Kreiton, stronger, mightier, higher in rank. It's self-explanatory now. Now it makes sense. It's talking about the sprinkled blood that speaks better than Abel's. Okay. So what have we learned today? That the moment that God uh, allowed Moses to sprinkle the blood on the people and the altar, if you speak against Israel, you are touching God's consecrated people. Maybe that's why that guy in Turkey, when he decided to speak against Israel, in the middle of the whole thing, he died. Heart attack. Boom. Collapse. Maybe that's why some Muslim dude in Pakistan Trying to challenge God and the whole, <laughs> it was like the Korah thing. Just boom, just collapse. You know, I mean, that's why everyone who tries to curse Israel always falls short. Why? Because God made a covenant with them. Now, we are accountable and we're responsible to be obedient to the conditions of the covenant. But someone outside the covenant does not have the power to curse. Because God already consecrated us. It's up to us to maintain our level of consecration. By obedience to the commandments. But even if you do, you still die. So therefore now, through the resurrection of Yeshua, now God has done something better and greater than the temple could. But that does not exclude the function and the purpose and the role of the temple. To still maintain God's sacred space, holy and consecrated. Okay? I'm honored to have a good teacher like Joe Good. To teach me on the temple. And I'm also honored to have some students and training uh, um, um, study partners like Ryan White, who was the mentioned to me about seven years ago, I think, about the word aphesis, and also in Romans chapter three about the word mercy seat, propitiation. And throughout the last 10 years, I began to piece things together. And little by little, I began to make more sense. And the more we study, the more we understand these things. But I think that it's important that you recognize that you cannot mention about offerings in the book of Hebrews and talk about Yeshua as a high priest and never even consider studying the role of the priest, the offerings, on the offer uh, on the sacrificial system. It makes no sense. How can we com com try to talk about a topic on a book that we don't study anything on? It makes no sense. How can we use 1 Peter chapter 2 to apply to a new priesthood in the order of Melchizedek when the text does not say that. It's talking to a different audience altogether. We have to be more accountable and responsible. And we have to stop minimizing what God has ordained to be his. His consecrated things, we need to leave alone. By the way, remember that the blood was spattered and sprinkled all the utensils, all the, all the things on the, the altar, the vessels, holy and holy place, the priests, his sons, you know, Aaron and his sons forever. So if you speak against the offerings, you speak against the altar, you speak against those things in the temple, you're speaking against things that have been consecrated through blood. You're no longer fighting against Jewish people, even the priests. You're fighting against the one who consecrated those things for him. And that's why I will continue to defend it and I will continue to stand for it. Because I understand that the people, Israel, they're consecrated to God. The priests are consecrated to God. And humanity now, through the parable of the, to the uh, miracle of the leper, the message of Yeshua's death and resurrection, is so that humanity can be consecrated back to God only if we accept Yeshua as our master, Julius, and we believe in our hearts, according to Romans 10, 9, that God raised them from the dead, so then we shall be saved. It's really that simple. So I'll leave it to you.
What is the purpose of blood? The power of ratification of a covenantal nature. So he put blood on the people, the priests, and also a leper. The only three times that blood have touched a human being in the Bible. Okay? So literally we have now been sprinkled with the blood of Yeshua. Literally we have it. But remember the day of atonement. That the high priest will take the blood of the, of the goat for the Lord. He take the blood. He go into the Holy of Holies. And he will sprinkle that, that, that blood on the altar to make atonement for all the children of Israel on their behalf. That's why the book of Hebrews is presenting Yeshua as a high priest. He's as a mediator, an intercessor between the people and God. Amen? Consider studying with me a wisdom in Torah. I'm going to be doing a study in the book of, he um, book of Romans, chapter by chapter. I already finished my teachings on the book of Hebrews, chapter by chapter. Go check that out before you study with me the book of Romans. And please help me share this on the uh, on um, YouTube and also Facebook. And uh, can keep me in your prayers as I'm going to go to Israel in uh, late January, early February, I think. And I'm looking forward to going back to the land with my tour. And then I'm doing a, uh, a temple course, a private temple course that I'll be doing there for 10 days. So keep me in your prayers. I want to get back to the land as soon as I can. And I will always stand for the God of Israel, for the people of the God of Israel, for the temple of the God of Israel, and also for the Messiah, whom the God of Israel sent so that we can have access back to his sacred space in believing in our Messiah, Yeshua. Amen. That God raised him from the dead. Shalom. Bye-bye.